go get through this morning is the rest of the basic uh, opening introductory discussion, uh, which I'll go through relatively quickly. And then we'll spend some time talking about um, ethics and social responsibility, uh, which are also very important topics, which, uh, which undergird the entire business discussion generally, both these dynamics discussions, the first three chapters totally, this uh, ethics discussion, and then the globalization discussion, which we'll start next week. Um, they all lay down essentially the framework, the context under which all of the business discussion and activity that we deal with occurs. Um, I want you to keep in the back of your mind now what we've talked about in the past, that companies are, are for profit motive. We focus primarily on uh, on for profits. Profit is what happens when you develop, deliver a value proposition such that what you, what someone is willing to pay for you, pay you, is greater than the, than the cost that it has, that it is for you to pull all those pieces together and what you're delivering for them is the value proposition. That value proposition allows you to create profit and that profit allows you to continue to invest in new opportunities and new business and essentially you create a a system that builds upon itself and grows because it brings in more than it expends and therefore it is able to grow and prosper. Not unlike a biological being, you eat more, you eat more than you expend and so you can grow and become stronger and bigger and, and, uh, and go to new places and do new things. That's what businesses do and that all comes from the value proposition and this notion of profit. So think about that at the micro level. At the macro level, we're talking about the, the, how resources are distributed and the role that these various businesses play um, in developing or distributing those, that, those goods and services. Um, these are the questions we talked about this last week. How goods are produced, where the services are located, um, all of those kinds of things are what the economic system supports. And we also talked about the fact that you have the laissez-faire capitalism economy where it's just markets, basically uh, every human being, every man or woman for her, him or herself going off and dealing with others in transactions, that's sort of raw capital markets, unregulated. Very few of those economies exist. Almost all of them have some level of government regulation, community regulation, so that people don't take advantage of others. Um, in fact, markets are not efficient if information is not, is not equally shared and so you need governments to help with that, to support that. And that creates this notion of mixed economies. Most countries of the world have, le have regulated capital markets and some level of socialism. Some parts of the economy are supported uh, by government services. These are ones that, effective, that aren't really effective with respect to markets. Uh, monopoly regulations like, for example, for your heat and power and you have street cleaning and those kinds of services provided by government, the, the roads would never have been cleared of snow if there wasn't a government function there that was supporting clearing roads for snow. Now, notice, some roads would be cleared right around the big businesses where you have private people doing it because all this money is coming in. But many, many areas of the city and the, and, the, and the surroundings would not be cleared because markets just would not be able to afford that. So that's what governments do. They build bridges and, and those are socialist services in a way because they're governed, the assets associated with that are governed um, and so are provided by the government and owned by the government and therefore there's this mixed economy notion. All, most all economies are mixed these days, okay? Keep that in mind when you hear debates about which way, what kind of government we want. It's all in the context of how mixed, how the mix should work. Not whether you're pure one way or the other, but how that mix, where you divide the lines in that mix. That's really what we talk about. So the free enterprise system is under, underlies that. We hear that term as well. What it really means is that individuals have the right to own property to own land, own equipment, have their own capital assets and money, and they're able to spend that and use it to build businesses, earn profit, grow from it in their transactions, as long as they're following the laws, and you can determine how you operate and how you spend your profits, and essentially you're on your own from the bottom up, 
to make use of your capabilities, your assets, your uh, training, your experience, all of that sort of thing. You make use of all that in order to build something that you then control and own. People and individuals as labor, as participants in the economy, can also decide where they work and what wages they desire and all of those sorts of things. Got it, Joshua. No problem. Um, so they, we have these situations, and individuals are free to choose where they work. They're not enslaved or indentured, uh, and businesses can begin and operate their individual uh, programs as well. Okay, that is the free enterprise system that we work under, and we work in the context of this um, of this hybrid economy, where certain things like there's bridges and roads, and they're all cared for. Uh, roads are cleared of snow and all that by a government service, but you go to privately owned uh, businesses like Walmart to pick up your salt or whatever, or, or, or the um, or Lowe's or Home Depot to buy your your snowblower. I use this uh, recent metaphor, um, and those are offered by private enterprises that make money and profit and all this. Um, and that's what that's the kind of system that we're operating within. Within that system, we have these this notion of supply and demand. And this is an important uh, economic consideration. You probably have heard about this, uh, but I want to make sure that we have a common understanding of what we mean by this. Supply is essentially what's on the shelves, how much of something there is. For example, how many people are willing to work is the supply of work workers, the supply of hours, the supply of college graduates for new employment. Demand is how many things people want to buy. That is, when you go into a Home Depot or a, or a Walmart, how many people are out there trying to buy um, salt or a snowblowers or whatever it is you're trying to buy when you go there? The demand is the number of customers. The supply is the number of items that for sale, right? And the interaction of supply and demand is what gives us the price. Here's an example. Hot dogs, people buying hot dogs. Well, did I ever say seven billion? Seven billion of them, average number of hot dogs. When you do analysis from a business perspective, there's a large macro number, like the seven billion hot dogs, but then there's a daily, there's a time factor to it. It's mostly in the summer. This is during football, I mean, excuse me, baseball season. They're consumed at a certain rate. You can do all sorts of um, mix, mixing and matching of numbers to try and understand where these purchases are going to occur. And you can see they vary by different football, by baseball fields. Um, Yankee Stadium is up there in the top ones. But as a economic system or as a private enterprise, you are trying to figure out not only how much the aggregate demand is, the seven billion, but you're trying to figure out where the demand is under what, in which organizations and the like, but also you're trying to figure out how much of that supply to place in each of those locations. So you're doing this logistics discussion or this logistics analysis about where to put things. Recently in the news, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the fact that the salt, there's not enough salt in some places for the roads in New York because it's more typically in upstate New York than downstate New York. They have a lot more snow. They have a lot more call for it on the roads. So they're shifting some of that supply around. Um, Amber, I see you put your hand up. Let's see. OK. <laughs> That's a good idea to charge your phone. It's also a good idea sometimes not to use your phone for this because the phone um, uses a lot of batteries for streaming video. Um, so anyway, but sorry, Amber. Um, I hope you don't lose your phone, and I hope maybe you could find a um, a PC that you can you can use as well or plug in. Um, so anyway, that what you're thinking about is not simply the supply and demand curve, which we'll look at here in a minute. It's not simply the supply and demand curve that says that as demand increases, which moves to the left, the price goes up. This is not illogical, right? As the demand goes up more people want it, the supply is the same, the price goes up. That's what this curve points out. The equilibrium price goes up. The same is true if the supply goes down, which means that red line shifts to the left. Under that scenario, there's less supply, but the demand is the same, then the price goes up. But if the supply increases, the price goes down, 
And if the demand decreases, which that green line goes to the left instead of the right, the price also goes down. But remember, this is also distributed in all those stadiums around the country. So the supply in each of those stadiums of hot dogs or rugs, if that's not in a stadium but in towns and cities, so this supply and demand occurs locally as well as nationally. So you have these various local markets for gasoline and all these different sorts of commodities that vary in price slightly. And the difference in price is determined by the timing of distributing the goods and services of the commodities, how long it takes to get from one place to another, but also how, uh, what the cost of transportation is. So oil is, you know, by gasoline is cheaper in the Louisiana area because there's refineries in Louisiana and Texas. You have to take that oil and ship it to the Northeast in order to refine it you know, up in this area. There's also refineries around here. But as you ship the oil to different places, that additional cost of shipping goes into the product. Um, so that affects the supply and demand. So all of this is the underlying dynamics of the resources in the marketplace, which the economic system is shuffling around to efficiently allocate resources. You're allocating some of this gasoline to Louisiana and Texas, some of it to Chicago, some of it to the Midwest, some of it to, to um, the, the mountain states. And you're doing it by these efficient market, these efficient market mechanisms. All sorts of room for fraud, as you might jump at and immediately note. But what we're trying to say is, that what you're saying is that that's why the government, that's why you have these hybrid models. The government makes sure that there's not Somebody, for example, might, might uh, artificially reduce demand by, call, by, by threatening people that bring supply into a particular region, right? Um, this is a crime syndicate of some kind. Might, bring in, might threaten people bringing in certain commodities like cigarettes or something like that or, or alcohol into certain areas, and that raises the price. Those sorts of things have to be controlled by someone. Um, and that's what that's what's going on with this uh, with, in this model. Okay, so that's the supply and demand notion. All right, Omar, did you have a comment? Omar, you have your hand up. Let's see. How, well, how can a business capitalize on supply and demand? Well, mostly what what happens is that you can increase the demand on your for your product by giving features or functions that are that people want more than what other people have. That's why if you have an automobile that is just a standard uh, sedan uh, and it's in com competition with all the other automobiles out there, the demand for your product is determined as some percentage of the demand for all of the other products and the competition with the other products like here, we see on this chart, pure competition, the competition with those other products causes the demand for your product to be down, to go down. And if the demand goes down, the price goes down, right, from that other chart, from the previous chart. If you're able to add features and functions to your cars, like you're able to add uh, better accommodations, you're able to add a better sound system, uh, you're able to add style that people like or appreciate, so that you differentiate yourself from the competition, then the demand for your particular entity goes up. And with demand for your particular product, as opposed to others, goes up, you're, you can charge a higher price, right? So that's how you're able to, one of the ways that you're able to, to uh, take advantage of this, um, the supply and demand uh, dynamics. Another way to do it is by managing the supply better. If you're able to have, to have more uh, control over supply and get supply to places that other people can't, you have a very good logistics systems like Walmart, so that when supply of uh, of salt goes down because there's a storm somewhere. Home Depot can't get salt, Lowe's can't get salt, whatever. The price is very high now because the demand is high and the supply is low. If you can get your materials in there logistically hours or days before Home Depot or Lowe's, then everyone will buy yours and they can, you can charge the higher price again because the demand is high and supply is low, and you're, have, you're uh, taking advantage of that supply. So by managing your supply chain more efficiently than your competitors, you can ca capitalize on supply and demand by taking advantage of a greater, having greater supply at a higher price. And by managing the, the, the features that you have, you can increase demand for your product. And that's essentially 
what the business strategy or arguments are all about, how you go about doing those two things effectively for each of your products in all of your territories. I hope that answers your question, Omar. All right, so we have these kinds of competition. There's pure competition, which is basically every person for themselves. This is the, the classic one where on a corner you have you know different kinds of gasolines and things, and they're all competing with one another. Um, and so therefore, people just look around and find the best price. There's also this notion of mon monopolistic competition, which there's only a few carriers, there's only a few suppliers. Um, airlines are that way. They used to be uh, more that way, and then there was more competition, and now it's consolidating again. Airline services, essentially there's only a few airlines that you can use. Uh, so they, um, they have this, this sense of having some level of control over the competition, over the, over the supply, if you will. Um, oligopoly is whenever there are a few businesses that um, they each supply a large part of the products that are in the marketplace, um, and there's only a few of them, and they essentially grip together and manage the pricing structure. And, that, and to do that in, in many economies, in many marketplaces, is illegal but not all over the place. For example, OPEC, in terms of the gasoline prices, the oil producing um, countries, uh, they meet together and they decide on what price they want for gasoline and then they produce only enough oil to keep the supply low so that demand is high and the price stays high. And so that's how they manage that process and that's its oligopoly. And then monopoly is when one entity essentially controls what you get. Um, there's attempts to make like electrical service and the different utilities more competitive, but by and large they operate more as monopolies. That is, there's only one electrical service, one water service that you can get. Uh, you know, forget your fresh water if you have uh, city sewage or whatever, or you have a sewage from a company or uh, trash hauling or whatever. Oftentimes those are monopolies. In which case, there's a different pricing structure that goes into effect, but we uh, we have to work out what those prices, those prices are. So all the markets are not completely efficient all the time. Perfectly competitive markets are kind of like this theoretical efficiency, but there are other kinds as well. And, um, and those are the ones that I've described. Yes, Caitlin. Well, how do you increase demand? Uh, demand is a natural phenomenon of the marketplace. It's, it's the buyers that produce the demand, if you will. Okay, wait a minute. Make it affordable? Okay, affordable to the average customer. Well, customers make choices about what it is that they want to purchase. They decide on the demand, and not just consumers, but businesses or whatever. They are willing to purchase certain things given what their uh, what the, their uh, their uh, utilities or their preferences are, and sometimes products are priced out of consumers' affordability, and so they can't have it. For example, um, watches is an in, is an interesting um, phenomenon because you could get a watch for five dollars, but Rolexes are you know ten thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars to get a Rolex. Well, that group, the, the people that make the Rolex watches, are targeting consumers that are able to afford them. And they create this, this scenario where they give up certain customers in order to raise the price to provide demand for a higher end product that only a certain smaller group of people can, can afford. In other words, the actual number of sales goes down. So making something affordable is not necessarily an objective of a business. A business wants to maximize profits, which could, means, could mean that a smaller percent of the population buys a larger, I mean, buys a more profitable product. And so your overall profits go up, although some people are left out of the market, right? So that's one of the possibility, possible things that can happen. Now, um, I don't see, Rico, I don't know what you mean by status there. 
Um, so I'm not sure how to answer, but I hope I answered your question, uh, Caitlin. Um, hopefully I did. Uh, the, the, the way, one of the things that you can do is you could increase demand and also increase supply, which keeps the price down, and that will keep it affordable. In other words, if you are able to create something that more and more people want, then you create more and more of them. So as supply goes up, demand goes up, the price could stay low. Okay. Um, again, the, the, the way, in order to keep the price down, there's two things. There's, the way to keep the price down is to keep the supply high. And one of the ways to do that is to produce it very cost effectively, which is like why you offshore the manufacturer of phones and the like is to reduce the cost of manufacturing them so you can have a higher supply so that the, the uh, supply and demand can cross at a low enough price. But one of the things you want to make sure that you're able to do when, as you do that, however, is that you have to make sure that the, the price that people are paying in that supply and demand curve, notice it doesn't say anything about what it costs to make the product. So you also have to be able to make the product at a cost that still allows you to make a profit which is why to make a smartphone affordable, you have to lower the cost to rock bottom, which means shipping most of the production offshore and also getting subsidies from the service companies. A smartphone costs like uh, eight, seven, eight hundred dollars actually in parts and certain parts and things, but it's subsidized and, and it would be much more than that if it was made in, uh, in higher wage countries. So that's one of the reasons why you have all this offshoring going on is to precisely do what you're saying. Everybody wants a smartphone. I would not argue that it's a necessity, although people treat it as a necessity. People didn't even have them five years ago, so how could it be a necessity? But at the same time, people treat it that way. So to make it affordable, you have to increase the supply. But as the price goes down, you have to make sure you can still make money at that, which means you have to reduce your costs which means you try to go to places like China or Malaysia or something like that to do the manufacturing, which takes jobs offshore. So there's this dynamic that's occurring underneath. Okay. Now, Omar, I see a note here. Um, okay, that was the question about the luxury and not um, and and not uh, and something that's a regular item. So I hope that that answers your question. Essentially, the dynamics are that if you want. To keep the price down, you have to increase the supply so that the demand and supply of the market clearing price is a little bit lower. But in order to increase the supply, you have to make sure that it's the price that it's clearing at, you can still make money. And therefore, you have to lower the cost of doing that as much as you possibly can. And that's what drives costs offshore or to other locations, okay? Uh, now, notice that's a little bit different than like a clearance sale where they're getting rid of last year's clothing, for example, and they're not really making money on the clothes. They're just clearing it out to get as much cash back as they can on the excess inventory so that they can invest it in the following uh, season's goods and services, okay? We can talk more about this uh, with other questions. These are very good questions uh, as we go forward, all right? So let's switch gears a little bit. All of this buying and selling that's going on, um, of all these products and services, the smartphones, the, um, the gasoline we talked about, uh, the stove blowers, the salt, everything that you're doing, all the food you're buying, the movies you go to, and all of that, is the US economy. The sum total of all of that is the gross domestic product, which we'll talk about in a minute. People buying more and more and more and more and more is called an economic expansion. As long as this, the, the total aggregate purchasing and of all the goods and services that are going on in an economy, as long as that's increasing over time, that's called an economic expansion. When it starts to get smaller, it's called an economic contraction. That is, the economy was generating, say, $10 trillion of economic activity a year. And the following year, it generates only nine trillion. That means the economy contracted, and that's what we'll get to in a few minutes. We talk about recession or depression. That's what's going on. Expansion is the normal part of the economy. It continues to grow because you get more people. 
people make more money, the, the, um, the economy continues to, quote, expand. It's growing. People are spending more. That's the notion of all of this stuff added together, all of the distribution of these goods and services, Walmart shipping salt and snowblowers around here to get things done, and, and all of the economic activity that's going on. If it's, grow if it's more every year or every quarter, it's expanding. If it starts to get less, it's contracting, and contracting is a bad thing. We measure this all with what's called the gross domestic product, or GDP. Gross, you add it all together, it's the, the sum of it. You don't subtract out the fact that people are selling back and forth and all of that. You add it all together. It's domestic. It's only what's happening in the U.S. Every country has one, a, GDP, a, 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 a domestic production cycle. And the product is everything that's good and sold, the sum total of everything that's produced and sold in a particular period of time, gross domestic product. That's the thing to be thinking about. And here's an example of the gross domestic product over a number of years. And you can see that it kind of has been expanding. It's an exponential, kind of a growth curve. Um, and you can see that little dip down at the end there. This, I think, ends in 2009, and that's where, this, uh, where we had our recent recession, and it dropped down. And now the economy is starting to recover, and it's kind of like on the original growth path, but a little bit lower than where it was or would have otherwise been. But all this measures is when you take one period, how much is the total goods and services? And then the next period, how much is it? If it's bigger, the number is higher. And if it starts to go down, you can see there's some dips here. Let me see if I could find the, a little arrow. There's some dips here. Oops, different time, different points in time, you can see. Each of these is a, if it's two quarters in a row, roughly, that's a recession. And this is our big one up here that we just saw. Okay, here's the Great Depression down here. You can see that it had a extended period of time. That's what we mean by this. And as you can imagine, if there's less activity, that's a bad economic time. You know, when there's less people buying and selling, um, it's a, it's a, it can be a bad equal time. And if you think about what happens is there's less selling going on. It could very well be that there's excess supply, which could mean that there's not as much, because the supply and the demand the, the supply is high, demand is low, you might have a situation where prices actually start to decline. And that is, that's called deflation, which can be very dangerous. The reason deflation is, is so dangerous is because if you think about it, if you think the prices are going to be going down next week or next month, why would you buy it now? You wait. Right? You wouldn't buy a car for you know, $5,000 now going back when we had the threats of deflation. Um, let's say $20,000 and do it now. Why would you pay twenty thousand now if you think it's going to be nineteen next month or eighteen the following month, right? If it's going to be going down, why would you buy it now? So all of a sudden you stop buying, which causes reduction in demand further, which lowers the equilibrium price and it feeds on itself in this crash kind of scenario. And that's what people worry about with deflation. It may sound bad. You may think, oh, gee, prices going down is great. It is not great because it stops people from buying. Inflation is a good thing because if you think the prices are going to be higher next year, you buy now. The more you buy, the more growth you get, right? So it drives consumer behaviors, consumer purchasing, and all sorts of business purchasing, and that is a good thing in terms of the GDP growth, creating new jobs and the like. And that's what's going on in the economy. That's the main macro measure. And here you can see growth rates over periods of time, and you can see how in 2008, how the market, how the GDP dropped in that Great Depression, or that uh, Great Recession, as we call it sometimes. You can see what happened here and how it started to come back, grew pretty good here for a while, and then continued to grow. And it's now continuing to grow as we go forward. And the expectation is something like 3% growth uh, this year and beyond, which, as you can see, is pretty close to the history right here. What you don't have is this sort of huge response to this drop that kind of catches up where we were but the growth of what had been the growth in the past were pretty much there at three or so percent, three or three and a half percent. So that's the, um, the, the situation with the overarching economy. Uh, one other note, you'll notice that where the U.S. sort of fits into a global economy with all these other people buying and selling. So there's the gross domestic economy and there's the world economy or the global economy, uh, global 
domestic product. And we're, we're in that range there, in the 25% range of the economy, the US. Um, the largest single economy in the world. China is growing much faster, uh, has been growing much faster, and so they ultimately might be, uh, be larger than, than the US. If, uh, if their rate continues at a higher rate than ours, eventually they may, they may cross over. People predict that they will, largely because they have a billion people buying and selling, and the US has about 300 million people buying and selling. So if everyone starts to buy and sell at a similar rate, their economy would be much larger than the US. Uh, but there's time for that, and it doesn't matter. It's good. This is a win-win situation. We're not really in competition with China. Um, there is a sort of a power thing, you know, who has the most influence. But really, um, we all can benefit from expansion, global expansion. Um, just a little bit of an overview of what, how we got to where we are today. But before that, any questions about gross domestic product, growth, all of those kinds of things? No? Well, oh, we got a question. Omar. Oh, well, uh, while we have the typing going on, let me just uh, review this real quickly. Um, where we are now, we'll read from the bottom up. Uh, the U.S. is primarily a service-based economy and an internet-based economy. What that means is that we do a lot of sales online. We do a lot of uh, long. Uh, we do we do um, we do a lot of like uh, telecommunications and things like that. But also uh, mostly a service-based economy in the sense that you know we have restaurant services, we have retail operations, we. We do services for other people, airlines, transportation, those kinds of things, um, as opposed to manufacturing the goods here in the U.S. We distribute and, and make use of them, uh, adding service on top of products. Um, it's, a, it's kind of like where the advanced economies end up. Earlier, uh, in, earlier in, our, in our growth cycle or in our development cycle, we did mostly manufacturing and marketing, meaning uh, the U.S. manufactured steel, manufactured uh, uh, food goods, uh, not just growth from the farm, but manufactured food goods like cereals and processed foods and all of that sort of thing, um, as well as uh, automobiles and all kinds of uh, manufacturing products that were then marketing and sold. This was the mid-19, uh, mid-20th century economy. Uh, Post-World War II economy, much of the world was destroyed or ravaged by the Second World War and the First World War, and the U.S. was untouched by most of the, um, the, the violence, the actual fighting on, in our geography, and therefore the, fa the factories and, uh, and fields and all of that were, were well positioned, and they pr pretty much started creating the goods and services for the rest of the world through the middle part of the 20th century. Earlier than that was the Industrial Revolution, starting in, uh, in Europe and then spreading to the U.S. with paper factories, and, and, um, and this is a, where factories started to play out. That was in the, uh, the late 1700s, 19, the uh, 19th century. Um, but earlier on, and when we did our history of our Revolutionary War history and the like, it's a farming economy, an agricultural economy, um, in, both in the South and in the North, and, and there's some, uh, some history about how that played out, but we went, but the U.S. goes from an agricultural economy through the Industrial Revolution, which is primarily started out in the North, then manufacturing in the 20th century, and we moved towards the latter part of the last century into this service and more internet-based economy. That's something to be, um, to realize that things don't, don't, aren't the same. The way the world is now is not the way it was 25 years ago. The way it was then was not how it was 25 years before that. This is changing, and it will continue to change. And during your lifetimes, uh, in your business careers, you'll see a different world 25 years from now than what I'm talking about right now. And that's one of the things you want to keep in mind, because not only is that the way things work, it also is where your opportunities come from for your own careers and for your own potential. And one of the ways to capitalize on that is this notion of the entrepreneur who, 
because of their unique position and understanding of the situation that's occurring, can go out and create something entirely new. All of those internet companies, all of those services companies I was mentioning that are dominant in the economy of the late 20th and early 21st century, they were all started by individuals. You know, Steve Jobs and uh, Steve Wozniak who started Apple. There was Mike, Bill Gates with Microsoft. Uh, these were a while ago, but you have Zuckerberg and you have uh, 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 Eric Schmidt and others in, in Google, and you have all of these people starting these companies. And they're all entrepreneurs. And before that, in steel, you had Andrew Carnegie, and you had Nelson Rock, I mean, um, John D. Rockefeller, and Eat Royal. All of these companies are started by people because they see change happening. And when they see change happening, they want to take advantage of it, or they want to make the world different based upon the way they see it. And that's this entrepreneurial thing. Almost all, most of the new jobs are by growth companies. They, they're continuing to replace old companies that can't respond and sort of go out of business. And there's, there's where the opportunity is. Any industry that you're in, new companies will ultimately, will ultimately develop out of that. In fact, the statistics would say that probably three quarters of you in this class will work for a company in your lifetime that doesn't currently exist today. Someone will start it, it may be you. It may be the person sitting next to you that will start it. Or you'll be there and start it or get in on the ground floor, but you'll be working for a company that doesn't currently exist. That's the nature of business. It's always replacing itself. It's, it's uh, actually quite dynamic and exciting. When I started in business, I sort of thought it was a, sta a stable thing. You pick your company, you join it, and you're there for life. That's, that's what it was kind of like when I started with the phone company with AT&T. But it's not that way at all. You, you have to continually create your future as well as the companies that you work for create their future as you go along as well. All right. So that's, uh, that's the entrepreneur. In the America, in the government, you have various federal, state, and local governments. They all intervene to control or to support the economy. Some people say they get in the way. Other people say they're there to support. And that's sort of like where the, the political debate is occurring. But don't ever forget, it's hybrid. It's not a matter of going all the way to, the, all the way to one way or all the way to the other way. Totally free markets, lazy fair, or totally socialist. It's somewhere in the middle. And where you balance that is really the issue. Try to promote competition, makes for more efficient use of resources. But you want to protect people that are, that are not necessarily on the powerful side of a relationship, consumers. You can have somebody sell them something that isn't really what they say it is, right? So you got to protect them from that. But also you have employees who don't necessarily have the same power position as, as uh, owners. And then the environment can be exploited. So you have to watch out for all of those things. That's where ethics comes in, which I had hoped I would get to today, but it doesn't look like I will. I will talk about that on Monday in terms of the um, ethics and social responsibility and what it means and also why it's becoming more important in today's business environment, mostly because of a lot of the sensibilities that your generation brings to the table and making sure that things that have been, uh, people that have been, and, and systems that have been taken advantage of in the past aren't in the future. Um, but that's what we'll talk about, the ethics and, um, and social responsibility, and make it clear how you can parse through and think through this. In business, Ethics is not a simple question because you're working for the owners, but you also have other stakeholders like your consumers and your employees. And oftentimes, it's not it's a zero sum game. You take from the employees, it goes right to the shareholders, or you take from the shareholders, it goes right to the employees, and you have to balance that. And it's not necessarily crystal clear. And I'll and we'll talk more about that uh, about that next week. Okay. So that's where we'll end up in, the, uh, in this morning. Like I said, I had hoped to get into a little bit more on this social responsibility thing. That's chapter two. But we'll have to go through that uh, first thing on Monday. Um, again, parentheses, assuming we aren't snowed out again. <laughs> um, and then we'll go into the globalization discussion, which is also interesting. These first three chapters are the background. And then we'll start talking about management. We've already done some of that. Um, and then we'll go into the rest of the material. Okay. So be ready Monday when you come in to, uh, to talk about this and also to have some time with your groups to do our final setup of who's going to do which
Titan who's going to be tiring on the Bill Gates discussion. And we'll work through that. I'll give you some time to get yourselves prepared and organized on, on Monday in class. Okay? Any questions before we wrap?